In this presentation, we're going to overview the mechanisms, the physiological mechanisms of fluid and electrolyte transport in the gastrointestinal tract. So for some of you, you might not have thought that the, the gastrointestinal tract has a lot to do with electrolyte uh, absorption, um, but it's all part of fluid and electrolyte absorption and is a key role of the gastrointestinal tract uh, and understanding it's important to understand electrolyte function, water loss, and rehydration therapy, which, as we'll talk about later, can be given orally, of course. So using a dog as, as a model, uh, let's take a look at the net water turnover uh, in the canine GI tract, and we'll use the example of about a 20-kilogram dog. In the GI tract, Endogenously, there's there of a dog this size, there would be about 2.1 liters of in, of secretions. Add to that uh, the dog's intake of 600 milliliters per day, so that's about 30 milliliters per kilogram, and that fluid, 2,700 milliliters, about half of it will will be removed in the jejunum and duodenum. And then moving further to the ileum, another 37% is removed. And that leaves, by the time you get to the colon, only about 12% uh, then need, is removed at that point. And in the feet, once the feces are uh, formed, you've removed basically 98.7% of the fluid in the uh, intestinal tract. So this is a very efficient uh, system, and we'll see that not only is the fluid um, being reabsorbed, but we have a lot of electrolytes that are being reabsorbed as well. So let's go over the overall fluid balance. Uh, the gain of water per day, you have water, uh, water that's ingested. We said about 600 milliliters, but it varies based on the size of the animal, of course and physiological and uh, pathophysiological conditions. Uh, then there's the amount that's secreted into the small intestine to help digest and absorb nutrients, including salivary, gastric, pancreatic, biliary, and intestinal glands. And then we have the absorption of water, most of which throughout the entirety of the tract is recovered, is reabsorbed 99% under normal circumstances. And then we have the small amount of water that's excreted in the feces, and this is variable based on health and, and pathophysiology um, that allows, in addition to the kidneys, allows the maintenance of fluid balance in the body as a whole. So with that quantitative background, let's back up and look at the big picture. What are the two major functions of the gastrointestinal epithelium. The first is that they serve a barrier function. It means they contribute to uh, the normal physiological function of the intestine uh, and allow um, basically there to be uh, a fluid uh, absorption process and, and nutrient absorption process. And of course, uh, a selection of those nutrients and fluids into basically the bloodstream. The lumen in the blood, we're going to talk about the apical barrier, apical surface of the GI tract or luminal surface, and we'll talk about the blood or interstitial surface as the basolateral surface of the GI epithelium. And then the second, and this is really the, the topic of this series, is the function of water and solute or electrolyte transport, both secretion and absorption across that epithelium. So let's talk about the osmotic gradient model, and I want to go right to the punchline that water will follow sodium. And that means that the GI tract is setting up a situation where it creates hypertonic concentration of sodium chloride in the interstitial space or lateral inter intercellular space. And it does this largely by the energy-driven sodium-potassium ATPase shown here. 
And so it's driving sodium into this space, increasing the sodium concentration relative to uh, the exterior ex ex the exterior milieu. And we're going to talk about two ways that the water can move uh, in, in a little bit. But this, uh, this driving force is osmotic. That's the key, osmotic. And uh, basically, the sodium chloride is drawing uh, the fluid from the exterior, which we're going to basically call the uh, lumen. Or that that's in the GI tract to the interstitial space, which is contiguous with the bloodstream. Um, so once water follows, and we'll talk about two ways you can follow, one between the cells through the uh, tight junctions shown here, these are tight junctions, and following sodium, or again driven by sodium potassium ATPase, it can cross the cell and move through the cell. And we'll talk about that as a transcellular pathway. It doesn't make any difference how the water moves um, at this point. It, what matters is that the driving force is osmotic and mainly sodium. And so the movement of water then pushes, uh, is pushing uh, water into the capillaries. And that's how you get reabsorption and increased um, extracellular fluid volume and circulatory volume. Now, just focusing on water, and here we here now what I'm doing is kind of reversing this slide, and I apologize for that. But here's our lumen over here. And this is done to make it look e easier to graph. And here's the blood or interstitium over here. And remember, we've created this uh, driving force with sodium being high here and relatively here. And water can move through the tight junctions down into the interstitium. The other way it can move is across the cell. And it, and it takes advantage of the aquaporins, uh, which are actually can be regulated. Uh, in, in the cell membrane, and it allows water to pass through the cell membrane following this gradient. So now we get into basically two different types of epithelia based on their permeability or resistance of the tight junctions. And uh, the first is a leaky epithelium, dominant in the small intestine. It has low resistance uh, at the tight junctions, and it allows for paracellular transport uh, of solutes and, and water through the tight junctions between those cells. And the fluid that's passed is pretty much isotonic. But the key here is that it can, be, it can lead to a large amount of fluid movement um, and allow large amounts of fluid in that uh, through that pathway. So, tr so the paracellular pathway in leaky epithelium allows for large volumes of fluid and solutes to move. And then we have tight epithelia, um, which are dominant in the colon, so much farther down the track, higher resistance. These are here we have transcellular pathway of uh, water movement is dominant and the fluid is hypertonic. And this is where, uh, very much like the kidney, aquaporins regulate water permeability. And this is where it's important to recognize that tight junctions are not just structural features. They can be regulated, and they're dynamically regulated, both in the healthy animal and also in disease states. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So using the, the solute of glucose as an example, so glucose absorption here on the y-axis and the concentration of glucose here on the x-axis, you can see that for transcellular absorption, we said that was a basically a limited type of absorption pattern. You can see that it, there's a capacity. It reaches its capacity right here. And it doesn't make any difference if you add more Glucose, uh, it does. It's not a lot. It's not moving more glucose and water uh, through that pathway. 
whereas the paracellular pathway is more or less unlimited. It's linear, so that as the glucose concentration goes up, the paracellular, or that is this, the water movement through the tight junctions, mostly in the small intestine, um, can go up linearly. So this shows you the entire absorption process based on just one example of an os osmotic agent, glucose. So now I'd like to tell you about how there can be physiological regulation of the tight junctions by a pathway that essentially would be a transcellular pathway. So starting with the uh, lumen, I'm going to look at the luminal content here, and this is the basolateral surface here. Uh, in the lumen, we have two very important uh, functions, uh, a, an exchanger of sodium and hydrogen here sodium hydrogen exchanger, and a sodium and glucose co-transporter. Uh, and it turns out that um, the, the sodium, that gradient that's uh, created by the sodium potassium ATPase uh, at the basal lateral membrane allows this uh, exchange of sodium and hydrogen. And then sodium can then be co-transported into the, uh, into the, epithelial cell and through it, uh, through the per through this process of sodium glucose co-transport. Now, when that happens, not only is there, so that would be considered through the cell membrane and, 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 and that would be a form of uh, transcellular uh, transport, but at the same time, this process leads to the activation of myosin-like chain kinase which can then, um, in addition, can in increase the activity of the myosin light chain kinase and then contract the actinomyosin ring and disrupt the tight junctions. And this allows for an even greater amount of glucose and small nutrients to come through the paracellular pathway. Remember, those are the ones through the tight junctions. And so what we're seeing here is basically that uh, sodium-dependent glucose co-transporters, also called SGLTs, uh, they're found in the intestinal mucosa or enterocytes, and that they can, under certain circumstances, not only regulate glucose through this limited pathway, but also through a more uh, a larger uh, mass and volume pathway by altering the paracellular transport uh, of glucose and small nutrients through the tight junctions. It turns out that the tight junctions can be disrupted in intestinal disease, particularly when the intestine is challenged by microbes, such as in a bacteremia or sepsis, and inflammation. In this case, tumor necrosis factor, TNF, is produced. And this leads to activation of the myosin light chain kinase and contraction of the actinomyosin ring, just like we talked about in the physiological regulation. Uh, and as a result, by the alteration of the sealing proteins of the tight junction, you get an increased permeability. And as this becomes more and more of a cycle of increased permeability and inflammation, you now see um, barrier dysfunction and actually the movement of entire bacteria across the epithelium. And this is where you can get um, the sepsis, uh, movement of bacteria into the, uh, into the bloodstream, and uh, bacteremia, um, either the products of uh, the bac bacteria, which would be sepsis, uh, sept a septic situation, or the bacteri bacteria themselves, if the pores and um, inflammation are, are great enough in size. Um, and this is uh, obviously disrupting the barrier function of the intestine. So in summary, we have two main functions of the GI epithelium, its barrier function and its role in secretion and absorption of fluid and electrolytes. In normal physiological conditions, about 99% of the water is absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract. Water is absorbed from the GI tract as a result of nutrient absorption accompanied by sodium absorption. 
in general, as a rule, water follows sodium. Keep that in mind. It's very important. There are two routes of trans epithelial transport, transcellular, which is across the cell, and paracellular, which is through the tight junctions and can be extremely high volume and dominates in the small intestine. Tight junctions determine the permeability of the paracellular epithelial pathway, pathway and are basically divided by two different types of epithelia. They're leaky and tight based on their propensity uh, for the fluid and electrolytes that can pass through there. And tight junctions are physiological regulate, regulated by uh, sodium glucose transport, other proteins such as the myosin lactane kinase associated with that. And barrier dysfunction can occur when the epithelium is challenged with a microbe such as with sepsis and bacteremia. Uh, 